Father Arch Abbott, Brother Norman, fellow Bearcats, and friends and guests. I am truly honored to have been invited to, uh, to talk about the Civil War at this uh, 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Uh, this was a time uh, in our country when lawyers predominated in public life. Some people think we have too many lawyers today, but if you do, you'd be sick if you knew how many lawyers there were during the Civil War era. Uh, during the first 75 years of our country, for example, uh, we had 16 presidents, 12 of whom were lawyers. During our last 75 years, from Obama back 75 years, we've had 14 presidents. All were non-lawyers except five. So we've shifted. In, uh, in Congress, it's the same thing. Lawyers dominated Congress at that time. In the single year that Lincoln served in the House, House of Representatives, 74% of the members of Congress were lawyers. Today, the current Congress uh, lists uh, law, law profession, as tied for second. So the lawyers are in a declining minority. Why? Why were lawyers so popular, so prevalent, so prominent during the Civil War period? Well, in Europe, in England at that time, young men of uh, ambition and promise, talent, without great wealth or great connections, uh, had their energies devoted to the clergy or the military. But the United States had no established church and virtually no standing army. And so the law became the avenue for them to advance. In most states at the time, there were no bar exams, very few law schools. The access, the entry point was fairly easy. When de Tocqueville came here <clears throat> in the mid-1830s, he was astonished at the role of lawyers. He said, they all think alike. They, they've all been trained in reading Cicero and Blackstone and Kent. Not that they all reached the same conclusions. They often reached entirely different conclusions. But these were men, and no women at the time, I'm sorry to say, these were all men who knew each other. They fought cases together. They fought cases against each other. Um, I list in the book, uh, a dozen examples where prominent lawyers, politicians during the Civil War period interacted in a variety of cases. It is no secret, it is no surprise, therefore, that all the members of Lincoln's first cabinet, except one, were lawyers. And that one got tossed out before the first year was finished and replaced by another lawyer. It is not surprising then that all of Lincoln's Diplomatic appointments were lawyers. The law during this period sometimes <clears throat> was the central focus of decision and determined the decisions and the outcome. At other times, the law merely shaped the events, uh, but other things controlled or determined the outcome. Sometimes the dark side of the law appeared, particularly, for example, after the war, with the revenge trials of the Lincoln conspirators. Mary Surratt is an example. If any of you have seen the new Robert Redford directed movie uh, called Conspirator about the trial of Mary Surratt, it's very interesting. Some lawyers were very brave at the time. Imagine if you were the lawyer defending, defending John Brown in Harper's Ferry when you know he killed your neighbors. Uh, brave people. In any event, the lawyers uh, animated, articulated, and argued the law. We can talk about lots of different topics, but, such as, all right, I should say I'm not very handy at this. Uh, that was uh, Dred Scott, if I can go back. Yeah, all right, this is the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Dred Scott case, which was seminal in many ways. This is the Supreme Court chamber, which was housed in the basement of the Capitol building 
which heard the Dred Scott case, John Brown, whom I just mentioned. Um, but we don't have time now. We can, we'll, we'll have a little time afterwards for some Q&A, uh, and then we can talk informally if you'd like to talk about any of those things. What I plan to talk about is uh, two events in the first year of the war. The first involving civil liberties, and the second involving the role of international law. And we'll touch on the Emancipation Proclamation and conclude. The Civil War was a horrendous experience in the United States. 620 people died, Americans died. More Americans died in the Civil War than all of America's war, wars put together. The Revolution, War of 1812, Mexican War, Spanish War, World War I, all the way through Vietnam and, and, and the War on Terror, whatever that is. Uh, <clears throat> where do you think the first blood was spilled? Fort Sumter? No. First blood was spilled on Pratt Street in Baltimore. Let me tell you about it, because it was kind of interesting. Just a few days after the fall of Fort Sumter, uh, in April of 1861, a regiment of Pennsylvania troops came through Baltimore en route to Washington to defend the capital. At that time, railroad trains coming from the north came to one station. They unhooked the rail cars and pulled them by horse for a mile to the other train station where they were re-put on the rails and went down. This mile that these Pennsylvania troops had to, had to transit was very difficult. Baltimore was known as a mob place. People mobbed all the time at the drop of a hat. But particularly here at that time, because Marylanders generally said, we're Union people, but we don't want to go to war against our sister states in Virginia, for example. We'll defend Washington and the Union, but we'll not uh, aggressively go after uh, our sister states. And therefore, we don't want northern troops coming through to do that. We don't want to assist in that. So there was a riot. The mayor and the police deployed 160 policemen to surround these soldiers as they transited. And they just got through. Uh, the <clears throat> governor and the mayor telegrammed President Lincoln and said, send no more troops. Unfortunately, the president misread, misinterpreted that instruction. He thought they meant, we can handle this. Don't send any additional troops to help us safeguard these transiting troops. The next day, April 19th, 700 armed soldiers from Massachusetts came through. They dismounted with their weapons and started this one-mile trek across downtown. People rioted. That's what this is. Uh, it got out of hand. Shooting started. 12 civilians and four soldiers were killed. That's the first blood spilt in the Civil War. That night, the governor and the mayor instructed the state militia, burn the railroad bridges north of the city. We can't have these troops coming through Baltimore. People will get killed. This is crazy. Um, one of the officers in the Maryland militia was John Merriman, and he promptly went out as instructed and burned one of the railroad bridges. Uh, the next group of soldiers that started to come down were wise enough under instruction they went out on the Chesapeake, came down the Chesapeake Bay into Annapolis, and then from Annapolis by train to Washington. Tense moment. Actually, in that tense moment, there was an absolutely absurd, stupid experience. Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, this great treasure of a ship of the United States, was at that time anchored at Annapolis. It was kind of a floating classroom for the Naval Academy. The Secretary of the Navy telegraphed 
the superintendent of the Naval Academy, protect old Ironsides at all costs, and if you can't, destroy her. We can't let this ship, this great ship, fall into Confederate hands. Okay. The first general <coughs> who came the water route then the next day, he was kind of a goofy looking guy who was a lawyer from Massachusetts, Ben Butler, General Ben Butler, arrived in uh, Annapolis, came up to the superintendent and saluted, and the superintendent said, General, are you here to save the Constitution? And he said, of course, we're all here to save the Constitution, thinking it was the document, the founding document. And they kind of stared at each other uh, and locked. It took a few minutes to get that straight. We turn ahead one month. The Chief Justice of the United States, Roger B. Tawney, was at his apartment in Washington when he had a knock on the door and two lawyers came, they said, we represent a man, his name is John Merriman. He was at his home in Cockeysville, Maryland, north of Baltimore, was in his bed earlier this morning. Troops came in from Pennsylvania, arrested him and brought him to Fort McHenry. Uh, and we've just visited him in Fort McHenry. Uh, he said he was arrested for having burned the railroad bridges north of the city. Uh, and we are here to present a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Chief Justice Tawney was very familiar with Fort McHenry. Chief Justice Tawney's brother-in-law, Francis Scott Key, wrote the poem that became the Star Spangled Banner over Fort McHenry. An interesting irony. A writ of habeas corpus is the fundamental civil liberty. It was an ancient writ which basically said the court orders someone, a jailer, anyone who is detaining someone, bring that person to the court and explain why you're detaining him. Uh, the queen could not uh, suspend the writ. It was placed in our Constitution before there was a Bill of Rights. It was that important. In effect, the founders, the, the drafters of the Constitution said, we don't think we need a Bill of Rights because we have the writ of habeas corpus in the Constitution. So the next day, Sunday, Tawney went up to Baltimore and he ordered the clerk of the court to issue a writ to the general of Fort McHenry, whose name was John Cadwallader, was a lawyer from Philadelphia, whose brother was a federal district judge in Philadelphia. And uh, he said, bring John Merriman to my court tomorrow morning. 11 o'clock the next morning, Monday morning, General Cadwallader did not show up, but a decorous Colonel Lee showed up with a sash and a sword and he said he was there on instructions from the general, and the general wanted me to tell you that under, he is authorized by the President of the United States to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and therefore he will not bring John Merriman to the court. The general also asked, through the colonel, can you uh, postpone further action until I can get some new instructions from the president. Tawney said, the general has acted in disobedience to the writ, and so he issued a writ of attachment for contempt, gave it to the marshal to serve. Tuesday morning, the next day, Tawney was leaving his daughter's home in Baltimore, where he usually stayed when he went to Baltimore from Washington. And he said to his daughter as he was leaving, the odds are I won't be home tonight. I'll be incarcerated in Fort McHenry. This wasn't crazy talk because within a few months, um, the mayor, chief of police, member of Congress, 31 members of the state legislature, several newspaper editors and publishers were all thrown in jail. Tawney thought 
that might happen to him. The next morning, that morning, he went to the courthouse, and uh, the marshal said, I went to Fort McHenry to serve the writ, and the general wouldn't open the gate. I couldn't get in. Tawney said, that's, that's the duty of the military to respond to judicial process. I'll write a written opinion so that there can be no misunderstanding of my views on this. Um, Tawney then, within three days, produced a 20-page opinion, which uh, is, I, I think, a classic, not only in law, but as a political document. This 84-year-old man, by himself, without brilliant young lawyers to assist him, wrote this document. Basically, he said, uh, the president has claimed to have the right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus on his own without congressional authorization, plus the right to delegate that authority to the military and let the military decide whether to obey judicial process uh, and never giving notice to the courts, to the press, to the public. This was all done in secret. He said the president claims to have unilateral power to suspend the writ, and if that's what his claim is, the Constitution gives him more power than is held by the Queen of England. In short, he said a famous phrase, the president has exercised a power which he does not have under the Constitution. Uh, Tony did offer Lincoln a face-saving way out. He said, perhaps the general misunderstood the president's instruction. Nice touch. Um, and then Tawney sent his opinion to the president, saying, I am the chief judicial officer. I'm at the limit of my power and authority. You are the chief executive. It is your job to see that the laws are enforced. It's on your plate. Chief Justice to Chief Executive. Kind of dramatic. Um, what other options did Tony have? Well, he could have suspended action uh, as the general asked. But my hunch is he figured there was enough time to get instructions from the president from Saturday to Tuesday. And secondly, there's a grave injustice here. Somebody's in jail, somebody's in Fort McHenry who shouldn't be there. The military has flaunted the judicial process. I can't let that go, I've got to act. He could have instructed the court martial to assemble a force and storm the gates of Fort McHenry. People could have gotten hurt or killed. He could have gone there himself and nailed the writ to the door like Martin Luther. But that would have been a bit too much theater. What was Lincoln's response? That's right, silence. Week after week after week, silence from the president. Until July 4th, May, July 4th. And the president sent his message to Congress, which is sort of a state of the union that we would think of it today. And I'll come back to that. Oh, heavens. Sorry about that. Um, the president's statement, which he didn't deliver, uh, they didn't do that then, a clerk read it, uh, was mostly about the events since Fort Sumter. Uh, the political and legal arguments against secession, the message was tough, strong, powerful, containing pithy phrases. It accused the South of insidious debauching of the public mind and engaging in ingenious sophisms. It showed the hand of a confident politician. Then when he turned to this John Merriman problem, not by name, everything changed. The tone shifts. Uh, the voice moves to the passive, the indirect. He said, it was considered a duty, not I thought there was a duty. It was considered a duty uh, to authorize the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. But the legality 
is questioned. He doesn't say by the Chief Justice of the United States. Um, it was not believed that any law was broken. That was it. That was all. Two days later, his Attorney General, Edward Bates, who was a runner-up to Lincoln in the election six months before, terrific uh, lawyer, issued a, an opinion, 20-page opinion, on the action. And it was a brilliant job, a kind of a superb piece of lawyering that one can do even when your client doesn't have a good case. He basically said, uh, he, he ignored much of Tawney's opinion, English history, textual analysis, uh, American experience, and so on. And he basically said the president has the power to detain anyone uh, whom he suspects is engaged in rebel activity. He said, in any event, this is a political question, not a judicial question. And conveniently, the president is the chief, judicial, is the chief political officer. In effect, he was saying, the writ of habeas corpus is a quaint, technical legal writ that has to move aside for national security. Does that sound, we hear some echoes of that today. What else could Lincoln have done? Well, he could have taken the escape route that Tawney offered him and told the general, General, you misunderstood what I said. Uh, but to do that would have uh, implied that he was knuckling under to Tawney. And he couldn't do that at that time. New president, young, inexperienced, massive war, the country splitting apart, even though Tawney uh, was a weak political figure. He could have asked the Congress to ratify his action, um, but he didn't do that. It was a very curious dynamic. What happened to, happen to John Merriman sitting up there in Fort McHenry? Well, um, on the 4th of July, same day that Lincoln's message was read in the Congress, the Secretary of War visits, oddly, Fort McHenry. And who does he meet with? Don Merriman. And eight days later, a letter comes from the Attorney General attaching a letter from the Secretary of War saying, release John Merriman, give him to the civilian courts. He was indicted, released on bail, and shortly the charges were dropped, uh, which is essentially exactly the way Tawney had argued the case should be. It should be handled by civilian authorities, not by the military, and the matter was resolved. My hunch is, although there's no record of this, is that uh, the Secretary of War made a deal with, the, uh, with, uh, with Merriman. Uh, we'll let you go, keep your mouth shut, stay home, don't do anything funny, don't sue us for false imprisonment, and this is the deal. And off he went. Uh, after the war, John Merriman was elected treasurer of the state of Maryland and was a member of the state legislature. Uh, in late 1864, Chief Justice Tawney died. And a month later, um, Mrs. Merriman gave birth to a boy. You'll never guess what they named him. Roger Brooke Tawney Merriman is who it was. Um, now, same year, 1861, let's go near the end of the year, when an incident occurred off the coast of Cuba that precipitated the most serious diplomatic uh, crisis of the war and brought the United States and Great Britain to the brink of war. The focus was international law. Confederate President Jefferson Davis appointed two new envoys to Europe. It was critical from the Confederacy's point of view to get recognition from the British, French, Spanish, and others. So he sent two people, um, James Mason, the son of George Mason, the found, one of the founding fathers of the Constitution, author of the Fugitive Slave Act, 
and John Slidell, uh, both of whom were lawyers, both of whom were U.S. senators before they went to the Confederacy. Um, Slidell, Louisiana French, he was going to Paris, uh, Mason to London. They, uh, both of them, slipped the blockade out of Charleston, got to Havana, and on November 7th, 1861, they left Havana on board a British mail packet called Her Majesty's ship, the Trent, headed ultimately for England. On the US side, this handsome devil is Captain Charles Week, Wilkes. Uh, and he was out on his ship, the San Jacinto, USS San Jacinto, in the Caribbean. His spies heard of Mason and Slidell going to move from Havana on the Trent to England. And he said, now, I know if I take them off that ship, it's probably a violation of international law, but what a prize. I can get these two guys, and it will be wonderful. Um, and there may have been a bit of a personal interest, too. Uh, years before, when he and Slidell were both living in New York, they quarreled over a young woman. And so this kind of said, I'll really get this guy. So Wilkes uh, sent two shots across the bow of the Trent and took Mason and Slidell off, sailed to Boston, and Mason and Slidell were put in Fort Warren in Boston. In the entire North, this was a cause for great celebration. We got them. Um, it was, and, and uh, the captain became a, a great hero. Uh, the House of Representatives struck a gold medal in his honor. The governor of Massachusetts had his great dinner. He was hailed as the hero because spirits in the Union were flagging because we had lost every battle uh, on the battlefront. And here we had this great victory. Enormous celebration. Uh, Lincoln met with his cabinet. What do we do? And everybody said, man, this is perfect. This is just what we needed. Our spirits are buoyed up. Except Montgomery Blair, uh, who was uh, Postmaster General, a lawyer. He had been Dred Scott's lawyer earlier. Uh, lived in Blair House in New York, right across from the White House. And he said, I think this is against international law. We can't hold these guys. We shouldn't have taken them. The British were furious. The British said, this is a flat violation of our sovereignty and a flat violation of international law. Uh, Lord Russell, who was the British Foreign Secretary, was as anti-American as our Secretary of State was anti-British. And he prepared a bellicose instruction for the British ambassador in Washington to deliver. It was a flame. In their system, Foreign Secretary prepared the instruction, and it had to go to the Queen, Queen Victoria, for issuance. And the route called for it going to, through Prince Albert, the royal consort, the love of Queen Victoria's life. He was dying at the time. He got the instruction and read it and made changes. He softened it, took a lot of the sting out. And in Queen Victoria's memoirs, she treasures this document. She said, these were the last words the prince ever wrote. Um, the British ambassador in Washington was told, deliver this ultimatum, and if Mason and Slidell are not freed within seven days, leave town because war will ensue. 11,000 British soldiers left England for Canada for the invasion of the United States. They put more ships out with 300 guns to destroy the American fleet and the American commerce worldwide. Pardon me, the Secretary of State Seward instructed the US ambassador in London, who was Charles Francis Adams, the son and grandson of American presidents and a lawyer. Tell the Brits, he said, that uh, the captain was acting without instructions. Smart move, that'll soften things. 
Uh, Adams wrote back mid-December and said, London, all preparations for war are underway. The New York stock market crashed. Price of gold went up. We were at the edge of war. Secretary of State Seward, the lawyer. Lord Lyon, the British ambassador in Washington, held the ultimatum for a couple of days, but on December 23rd, he brought it into a cabinet meeting and, and said, we, we have to do something. And he said to the president, I think we have to let these guys go. And Lincoln said, well, uh, I'm not sure. And just then the French ambassador came in and said, I'm, I'm here to tell you that the French government sides with the British government on this. That really upped the ante. Lincoln then relied on a tactic he learned when he was uh, first practicing law in Springfield, and that was to write out the other person's argument. So he said to Seward, you go back to your office, Seward, and come back tomorrow morning, and I will, in the meantime, write out the best arguments for not surrendering these guys. So the next morning, uh, <clears throat> Lincoln said, I couldn't come up with a single good argument that we should retain them. Seward and the president agreed there would be no apology, but we'll release these guys, and we will, we will, we will acknowledge that they did not act, that he, Captain Wilkes, did not act in accordance with international law. The cabinet agreed. January 1st, Mason and Slidell were released from the fort in Boston and were put on a ship to England. The British said the matter was closed, war was averted, and international law was complied with. This is an example of where the law played a significant role, but other things played a more dominant role. And Lincoln put his finger, of course, as usual, on the other main other factor. He said, I've got one war, I can't afford two wars at the same time. Um, now, I'd like to talk a little bit, and then we'll round off, uh, about ending slavery. In 1860, there were about four million slaves in the United States out of a population of about 31 million. In his inaugural address, uh, March 4th, 1861, Lincoln dealt head on with the slavery issue. He said, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it now exists. I believe I have no lawful authority to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Lincoln had trouble with some of his generals over the slavery issue. Some generals uh, would be freeing slaves in their theater of operation. And Lincoln had to stop a couple of them and stomp on them because he felt this was his responsibility, not some general in the field. Uh, one of the most severe occurred uh, in uh, May of 1862 when Lincoln had to uh, disown the proclamation of one of his generals, General Hunter. But he used the occasion, Lincoln did, to lay out his own plan for emancipation. Most of us think of the Emancipation Proclamation. That wasn't what Lincoln really wanted to do in terms of ending slavery. Lincoln's plan that he published in his proclamation in May of 1862 in Lincoln's plan, emancipation, ending slavery, had three components. It should be gradual, it should be with compensation, and it should be accomplished by the vote of the people. That was the way, the only way it could be done, he felt. This is the way the British did it, the British Parliament, in 1833. Um, in his proclamation of, again, May 1862, he begged, he literally begged for support of this plan. And I'll read 
the key words to you and think, if you like a Puccini opera, think of, of, of the melody of a Puccini opera floating behind. Lincoln said in his formal document, I beseech you, I beg of you a calm consideration the change contemplated, gradual, compensated, and by vote, would come as gently as the dews of heaven, not rendering or wrecking anything. Will you not embrace it? This was a passionate, powerful statement. Um, six months earlier, Lincoln tried to sell this idea to the state of Delaware, the tiny little state, less than 1% of the population, were slaves. He figured if it's going to work anywhere, it'll work there. If I can get Delaware, then I can get Maryland, then I can go on down, and this is the way it'll work. So he worked out with, a, with the lone congressman from Delaware uh, a proposal. He, he literally, Lincoln, drafted state legislation for Delaware that would arrange for compensation. Um, the emancipation will, would go gradually until 1893. Can you imagine that? Uh, financed by U.S. bonds. And his pitch to the people from Delaware was, you slaveholders here in Delaware, you'd be smart to cash in now. Because when the war ends, one way or the other, your slaves aren't going to be worth anything. Buy into this deal now. You'll be compensated, smart money. This is what you ought to do. Delaware said no. We're not going to do it. Well, just two months after that May proclamation where he beseeched and begged for his plan, he called a special cabinet meeting of, sorry, that's September, July 1862, and said, and he handed out a draft that he had written. Can you imagine the confidence of, of, of a lawyer to write a document by himself of this magnitude? He said, here it is, gentlemen. I think this is a military necessity to save the Union. Uh, he said all slaves held in rebel areas uh, were to be forever free. The plan did not reach to the border states, which were slaveholding, so it didn't reach to Maryland or to Delaware, etc. And the reason was, he figured, my war powers can't reach where there's not a war. There's no war there, so I can't do it there. The Attorney General Bates said, I think that's a good idea, but um, we really ought to have mandatory colonization. When we free the slaves, we need to get them back to Africa. Secretary of War Stanton saw the military issue clearly and was all for it. Secretary of the Treasury, Chase, who later became Chief Justice after Taney, was worried about the legal issues. He said, you know, uh, you might get taken to court, why don't you let your local field commanders do this? So it'll be local action in other states and we can control it better. Seward, Secretary of State, said, look, I think this is a great idea, but your timing's not good. Wait till we have a battlefield success and then go ahead with it. Because otherwise, the French and the British will think we're acting out of desperation and that we're gonna lose and they'll recognize the Confederacy and and we'll lose. So it's interesting to see all these lawyers sitting around the table discussing this document. Mid-September, September 17th, the Battle of Antietam, which was sort of a victory, was enough for the president to say, okay, we've had enough of a victory. Called a cabinet meeting, which this slide shows. And he said to his cabinet, I'm gonna issue this today. We can make a little change here and there, but this is going out today. Uh, and in 100 days, on January 1st, it'll become final. I'll make some minor adjustments. Um, and he issued it. The reaction to the preliminary proclamation on September 22nd, 1862, was not what you'd think. We honor this today. But at that time, it was pretty tough. The Times of London, for example, the most prestigious paper in the world, said this viciously. Mr. Lincoln wants to excite servile war in the states which he cannot occupy with his arms. And when the blood begins to flow, 
and shrieks come through the darkness. Mr. Lincoln will wait until the rising flames tell all that all is consumed, and then he will rub his hands and think that revenge is sweet. Tough. Tough language. Um, Blair was right when he said the, uh, the, the, the impact of the preliminary proclamation on elections in, in that fall was going to be tough. He said, we're going to lose, fellas. This is, this is going to, and he was right. 31 Republicans lost in Congress. Uh, they lost the governorships of New York, New Jersey, and even Illinois. And it was a disaster for the Republican Party. When asked about this, you can kind of picture it on C-SPAN. Mr. President, what do you think about the disastrous uh, results of the election? Lincoln said, well, I felt like the boy who stubbed his toe while he was running to see his sweetheart. The boy said he was too big to cry, but too badly hurt to laugh. That's what it was. The sharpest challenge to the preliminary proclamation came from the former Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Curtis. He was the justice who wrote the eloquent dissent in the uh, Dred Scott case. He left the court shortly after that, living in Massachusetts, and he, he wrote a blistering critique of the president's overreaching on civil liberties and, and on freeing the slaves. And he said this in part, with what sense of right can we subdue them by arms to obey the Constitution as the supreme law in their part of the land if we have ceased to obey it in our part of the land? An executive proclamation cannot repeal valid state laws. All the powers of the president are merely executive. He cannot make a law. He cannot repeal a law. Tough. The cabinet meeting, the final cabinet meeting, December 29th, uh, they had a final review of it. Chase said, you better put in something at the end about God and justice. It'll sound better. You hear these discussions just like you have today. Lincoln said, that's a good idea, God and, and justice. Um, he changed the part about slaves shall be forever free, Lincoln did, because he was concerned about uh, a wartime, what, what can survive the war if it's a wartime measure? So he, he didn't say they are forever free, because he's not sure after the war would they be free. Um, the idea of compensation and colonization was all dropped. New Year's Day, Lincoln got the proclamation to sign. He put his lawyer's, on, lawyer's eye on it, found a typo, sent it back to be redone, and then signed it. At that time, you know, the president always held a levy, they called it, open house on New Year's Day. And he had been standing downstairs, shaking hands, all day long with people. And so when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, his hand shook. And he said, he said, I don't know how future generations are going to read this. They're going to think I was so scared about signing this thing when it was fact only that his hand hurt. Wait, <clears throat> I read to you in the beginning Lincoln's March 4th inaugural address where he said, I have no legal authority to interfere with slavery in the states where it now exists. I have none. How come he can do this now? Well, Lincoln would say, uh, at that time, there was no war. Now I've got a war. I'm commander in chief. I have war powers. And I can do that in accordance with my war powers. That would be his, uh, his argument. This drafting of the Emancipation Proclamation, I think, is a, is a good example of where the law had a significant role in shaping the result. Just speculate for a moment. Pretend you were sitting in the cabinet room three months later, and Lincoln says, hey guys, read this new draft I've just done. It's another document, another proclamation. It gives title to former slaves, now freed, title to the plantations, the real estate, 
owned by the former slave owners. Military necessity in my powers as commander in chief, because the slaves then would become property owners, would have an incentive to resist the rebellion and support the Union war effort. What do you think? Good deal? Well, as you think about that, pretend the next month he calls you in and says, OK, I've got another proclamation. This time, I will authorize any former slave to treat any resisting slaveholder as criminals. Capture them, and if necessary, use force against them, including deadly force. State laws on homicide are suspended. Once you start down the road, it's kind of interesting to see how far you can go and what will happen. You've been very patient. Let me just take literally one more minute. That's an applause line. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I have to skip that. In, uh, <clears throat> in the early 1800s, George Washington's adopted son, Washington Curtis, built Arlington House. His daughter, uh, Mary Custis, married Robert E. Lee, and when her father died, Mary inherited the estate, 11,000 acres. When war came, Mary Custis Lee was ordered to leave Arlington House, and the estate was taken over to be used as a union headquarters, a hospital, a cemetery, uh, and later a freedman's village. Arlington House. In mid-1862, Congress passed a law requiring that all property taxes in insurrectionary areas be paid in person by the owner. Mary couldn't leave her home in Richmond to pay the property taxes on Arlington on the estate. She sent her cousin into Washington to pay the tax. The government said, sorry, Mary has to come herself. So the government confiscated Arlington House and the whole estate. After the war, uh, <clears throat> General Lee refused to consider suing the United States for return of the property. Um, when, after Robert E. Lee and Mary Lee died, their son, with the interesting name of George Washington Custis Lee, inherited Arlington. He brought a lawsuit uh, claiming that the estate was wrongfully confiscated and he wanted it back. He brought the lawsuit in 1877. It went to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided in 1882 that the taking was un unconstitutional and the estate had to be returned to George Washington Custis Lee. That presented a practical problem because you had graves, Freedman Village, all kinds of things. So <clears throat> Lee worked out a deal with the Secretary of War under which the United States would buy the estate from Lee. Uh, the Secretary of War was a young lawyer from Illinois, Robert Todd Lincoln. An interesting example of where vengeance turned to reconciliation. And the son of Robert E. Lee, the son of Abraham Lincoln, negotiated a practical, simple, reconciling, which is quite symbolic. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your patience. <clears throat>